Welcome back to What's New with Mead. Today is going to be a little bit of a different episode. We're on episode eight. And um, this is from a live stream that I did on Saturday, uh, April 18th. So I, I got on there and I wanted to make a boche and do it on video and talk to you guys. So basically what I did was, was exactly that. This whole topic or the whole podcast today um, is about boches and a, really a bunch of various questions that you guys asked me. So if you uh, um, you know are interested in finding out more about my mead making beyond boche, you'll find that out today. It's a long episode. It's about over an hour and a half. And uh, you know I, I had a lot of fun doing the live stream. Um, I hope that you will enjoy this video. And yeah, thanks for watching. And um, here you go. Hope you guys are doing well tonight. Um, make it a boche. So uh, I wanted to do something a little different. And I'm going to be, I got my chat here, got the camera there. Going to try to make this work as best I can. So bear with me if it's a little bit crazy. Uh, good to see you guys. Um, I am using some uh, orange blossom honey and making a boche. And I'm calling it the 10K boche uh, because we're at like 9,800 subs or something like that. So we're almost at 10K subs and I think it's 10K boche. Uh, that sounds fancy, so I'm going to roll with that. But um, I am using three and a half pounds of uh, orange blossom honey. And uh, then, of course, a gallon of water. We're just making one gallon boche. Um, and today, I, I really like using the uh, the EC1118 for boches. I've had a lot of good luck with that, so I'll be using that. But we're, a, you know, we're quite a ways from actually adding that in um you know we'll get there but this is my pot that i'm doing my honey in and i just started a few minutes ago um it is already looking like it's going to get going i need to make my little honey wheel so i'll get that set up how are you guys doing what have you guys been up to hopefully you're not too bored in quarantine life um i know it's really easy to uh be mindless at this point so hopefully you're finally finding something to do pair me today six gallons ah that's pretty sweet um how much honey did you put into it i always do my boches in um 15 minute increments so in my on my wheel doing 15, which reminds me, I need to set this, uh, 15, 30, 45, so on. I'll probably stop in an hour, um, or an hour and 15, excuse me. It just depends on the coloring. So this is what we got to start with. And, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna see, I actually need to, um, get my first sample. If I miss a lot of comments today, I apologize. I am bouncing back and forth. And if you've ever made a boche, you know that uh, it's not exactly the um, nicest mead in regards to, um, you know, sitting back and not doing anything. You kind of have to be on it while you are uh, doing it. Otherwise, the, oh shoot, I don't want that there. Um, it will overboil. I've had that happen. I'm already making a mess. This is not a good start. Okay. Uh, I'm also going to be using this for um, this week's uh, What's New with Mead. So if you want to ask me questions, I am going to be using this time to answer your questions and hopefully talk about a boche. Um, the main topic of this, of the, uh, of the podcast this week is going to be a boche. That's why I'm making one now. So I thought it'd be fitting, but uh, I thought I, I would uh, throw together something like this and get to talk to you guys because hopefully I can be some source of entertainment right now. Oh man, let's see what we got going on. Try not to overboil. About to do your apple pie recipe. Dude, I, I love that apple pie meat. I'm for sure gonna make another one. Um, when you make it, I would highly suggest that, uh, I've made it two ways, I'll put it this way. I've made a, or three ways really. This thing's about to go crazy. Yep. Ooh, there we go. So I wish I had a camera to like show you guys what's happening here, but 
we uh this is not the the tallest pot um i actually made a boche a week ago now and um i have a, a big five gallon pot and i put 20 pounds of honey into that so this is only three and a half pounds i didn't really want to pull out my um huge pot for three and a half pounds because i felt like that was kind of silly so once we find our sweet spot for boiling we'll be good we have yet to find that though but what i was saying about the uh the boche uh, or the apple pie mead i've made it three ways i've made an apple pie mead uh started with the traditional then i added the apple pie filling to it and that turned out really great um I like that. It had my only problem with it. It was that it was a little more spice heavy than the than I would like. It didn't have as much apple pie flavoring. So that was my big problem with that. Then I also made a uh, apple pie mead with the Amaretti flavoring. And I did that worked out really well. Um, I preferred that because I I got more of an apple pie flavoring, but I also got was able to put that honey with it and made it really good. The third way, my favorite way is the apple pie boche which is where you, of course, boche, caramelize the honey, and then you do the same process. I actually put into that one um, uh, the apple pie filling, and that worked really well. So you have lots of options if you want to make that mead, or really your own options too. Mold, oh, I had a mead going, felt mold. I have had that, it sucks. It is not the most fun thing to deal with. All right, we gotta get the sweet spot in this. Have you ever tried using basswood honey? I have not used basswood honey before. I have heard that it's really interesting though. Um, I have used at this point uh, orange blossom honey. That's what I'm using right now. Clover honey, uh, mesquite, avocado, uh, just like Baker's regular honey. What else have I used? Oh, Tupelo. I've done a Tupelo bean before. It's really interesting. Tupelo honey is super expensive though. I'm not a big fan of using it because it's so expensive. Uh, I, I it's just not my favorite thing. But I've never used basswood, unfortunately. Apple and cinnamon boche. That sounds really good. Yeah, it's it's like a um, like the apple pie mead we were just talking about. What other recipes do EC one one eight go well with? The only yeast I'm stuck. Uh, it's the only yeast. So the EC one one eight actually has suited me well for, for for boches and traditional meads. It gives a good warm honey character in a traditional mead, and I like that. And it also does the same thing for um, a boche, so that's helpful. Um, I've used it with berry recipes before, like cherries and dark fruits. That's something that a lot of people will say is um, great for it. They use, they use it for that reason. But I also have been um, trying to experiment with like lighter fruits too and use it for more you know, overall purpose things. The big thing is that, uh, I wish I could show you guys this, but I can't. Um, the big thing with it is that it gets up to 18%. And so if you're going to put some honey into this, like either if you want to have a sweet version of a mead with the EC1118, you're going to have to stabilize or you're going to have to put a ton of honey in to surpass 18%, which is a really heavy mead. So I don't know if you have opinion oh alfalfa yeah someone said alfalfa i definitely i forgot about that that's silly have my first sizer going fresh apple cider yes i really want to get to the cider side of life i'll get there at some point have you thought about using a slow cooker to caramelize the honey i have i'm a little scared to if i'll be honest um i've definitely made i've only made boches this way i've only cooked the honey on a stove and most of the time i end up with a pretty good product in fact i still have my um I'll show you guys. This was the boche that I made, uh, or at least the color wheel of the boche that I made from about a week ago. It's the honey's, yeah, honey's going crazy. But uh, I think I got some water on here. This was the start, 1530. It ended up here at an hour and 15 minutes. So that thing, you know, changed quite a bit. If you know anything about a boche, um, it is just caramelizing the honey. But really what occurs is that the, the honey changes characteristics, like the honey characteristics change over time. Because what you're doing is you're heating the sugars within that uh, that honey to different points. Because honey is made up of a bunch of different sugars, you're finding that some of these sugars are caramelized at certain points. So um, I think there's like four or five different kinds of sugars in a honey. 
And each one has a different caramelization point. So when you're making that honey or that mead, excuse me, um, if you heat it for a long time and at a high heat, you might end up caramelizing certain sugars that then become that they can't be eaten by the yeast. Therefore, you get some sweetness and different flavors. I really like pochets because I get a lot of good um, whiskey notes out of each one for some reason. I've, I've experienced that quite a bit, but I've never used until this past week, never used Florida orange blossom honey. So we'll find out what that's like. Um, thank you, Leith Perrin. I appreciate the uh, compliment. Currently making blueberry mead, apple pie, boche, hot pepper, sriracha mead. That's interesting. How much honey turns into non-fermentable sugars? That is the, uh, that's a good, great question. Um, it depends on the heat that you are, how much heat you're applying to that mead. Because in reality, not all the sugars will change, um, only a portion of them. And it depends on the, the honey, because there are certain different, um, different kinds of sugars within some honeys. So not each one is the same. I wish I could tell you all the different kinds of sugars in a honey. I can't, I just, I don't know that knowledge. I should. I actually am drinking tonight. A, uh, this is, I call it the blue honeymoon ale. I'll try to get it and get the light. Maybe there we go. This is my, uh, this is what I'm drinking tonight. This is a blueberry braggot that I made and it is, it has a uh, bow shade honey in it. Um, I did, I made a, a blueberry ale base for this mead or for this, the beer. And then I added instead of, well, it was a, I'll say this, it was a blueberry honey ale. So it came with honey, had about two pounds of honey in it. I doubled that and basically made it into a, a braggot. So this has some nice boche characteristics in it. Have you ever used Manuka honey? I can't say I have. Honestly, that's that's one I've never heard of. Um, I have been using a couple different sites. I use Dutch Gold for a lot of my honey because it's really simple. Um, but I recently changed to a, or started using a different company because they had a little better prices. Uh, it's this restaurant. Basically, you know, they they sell uh, products to restaurants. Um, they had better prices for this orange blossom, so I bought the orange blossom through them this last time but but nuka honey has never been on my thing uh evan you said how, how do you make your labels here's something that's been a struggle for me and you guys have been asking me for a long time to do a label video and i really want to truthfully i i absolutely want to here's my problem my computer that i use it cannot do screen recording well I'm having troubles like recording my screen to be able to do anything. Um, and I've tried it many times. It becomes, gets really laggy. Uh, it just doesn't work. And so I'm workshopping ways to try and sort this out to be able to show you guys a, a video of how I make my labels. Um, but I haven't got there yet. But the short answer to tell you, Evan, is uh, the I have a friend who designed this these labels for me. So she she made a bunch of different ones. You've seen probably a few of them at this point. Um, she designed the guy and, you know, like the hands and all that stuff. Um, but then like, I just go through and I don't know if you can see it here. There's all my ingredients down here. Um, it, it, I just basically change out the information on some of these things and the colors. So, uh, thankfully she, I, I paid her to, to do this for me. So, um, I appreciate her time and all those things. Um, and she, gave me a bunch of label options. That's what I do. My hope is that when I make a video for you guys, I can give you some options for making labels for yourself and not necessarily have to pay somebody else to design them because I know that's expensive and not everybody can do that. I mainly did it because uh, I give out a lot of bottles and I feel this like, I would love to hear what you guys think in the comments, but I feel like if you give somebody a bottle with a label on it that looks nice, they're more likely to to not necessarily to drink it, but to like accept it. Whereas if you give somebody a, a blank bottle and you go, Hey, try my homebrew. Uh, they might be like, ah, I don't know. So I really wanted to do something nice with labels and I, you know, I've obviously, obviously been able to reuse them. 
Sounds like you're running low on VRAM. Yep. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's a lot of money to get an upgrade like that. Have you tried Fusion Teas, Hibiscus Teas? Um, I have made a few tea meads before. I did a, uh, I called it an ex the experiment mead, and it was basically a spearmint tea mead. Um, it didn't turn out very good at the time. It's gotten better over time. Um, other than that, I've used peppermint tea. In my peppermint mead, I've done uh, many times now, the the peppermint flavor was strong enough. The problem was I had to I had to cut off some of the sugar, so I used peppermint tea. Other than that, I haven't really used much peppermint, or sorry, much tea, I should say. Uh, screen capture video on. Yeah, I need I need to look at that. Um, Twelve gauge. Thank you for that. I'm that's awesome. I'm glad you got your first one going. Um, labels hey bob you need to contact me my friend i don't know if you realize this but you want a bottle recently and uh we need to i need to get that to you this thing one thing i love about a boche is um it smells great like one the honey smell is already nice but then you have this like caramelized thing happening and it's super good i, I really like it we're almost to 15 minutes now of um Beauchade honey and i will in a moment show you guys the color wheel the problem with is if i put it on here i have to let it set for a second so that it will not drip everywhere it looks a little nicer but the colors are going to start to change as the sugars change and i think that's interesting yes bob you do need to contact me my friend i don't know if you follow me on instagram but um do you not need, no, I, uh, Michael, you don't need to constantly stir the honey because, um, I actually, in my experience, if I, if you constantly stir the honey, you make more foam and more foam often leads to a big mess. So I don't really stir it. Um, I will do a little bit at the 15 minute mark just to move around some, but with it boiling as it is, it's not sticking to the bottom. Like you'd think, um, like you think sometimes when you cook like spaghetti or something that some sticks excuse me to the bottom obs is free that's actually the uh my, the thing i'm using um uh, that i've had trouble with i've tried to edit settings and do stuff like that honestly just don't have a strong enough computer powerful enough computer to be able to do the streaming stuff i want to do so that's unfortunate if you're just tuning in thanks for um for popping in we're making a boche today and uh, this is the 10K Boche because we're almost to 10K subs. One way you can guys, you guys can really help me out. There's my timer. Is share the channel, um, share this video, share a video, something. Let's get to 10,000 subscribers. Um, it'd be really cool if it happened tonight, but I don't think it's gonna. Um, not ye little faith, but I'm just. I don't want to build that expectation. All right, we're at 15 minutes. Let's get a. Diff or another check for a little bit darker that really will start to hit in or set in as we get to like the 30 45 minutes um and then of course hour 15 is where it really has changed Let's set our timer up again another 15 minutes and there we go um i want to get back to my comments maybe my heat's too high when i make which a constantly stir uh yeah i keep mine really low Right now, my um, heat goes up to uh, to high or, or 10. Um, I keep mine at like 30, 40%. And even on my big boche I made recently with 20 pounds of honey, I still kept it around that range and it worked well. It was good. I've got three gallons that are just about done bubbling. Would it be okay to rack off into a clean, wait. Uh, yeah. Um, Terry, you could do that. Uh, I would, if I were you, I would honestly just spray a spray down like a pot or a pan. If you don't have any other vessel, um, like this, if it's a, I said three gallons, how much did you say? Oh yeah. Three gallons. That's hard. That's a lot of liquid. If you have a big pot, that's like three gallons. I would spray it down with some star sand, some sanitizer, put it in there, clean out your, your carboy or jug, whatever you're doing and put it back in. But, uh, milk jugs are sketchy to me. I don't know why. Uh, I just feel like if you put something in a milk jug, 
no matter how well you sanitize it, it still has stuff left over on the side of the jug. Let's see. I think I'd love to um, love to get. Let's see. Sorry, I'm, we are at nine thousand. 820 subs, which is awesome. That's crazy. Um, another reason I really want to use OBS to be able to record things is I have some ideas for videos that require me to use my computer more, and I can't do that right now. Well, I mean, I can use my computer to edit, but I can't use it to record the videos that I want. So, in fact, like I'm streaming from an iPad right now, so uh, and I'm using you know AirPods to to talk to you guys. So I'm I'm not really all that high tech, unfortunately. Uh, let's see. I sorry, I'm trying to find something on here. Okay, I would love to know what you guys are making. What's uh, what's something that you've been doing? We've all been in quarantine, obviously, so um. Maybe you found some some time to make some meat, hopefully. Um, I would love to hear about your own meat experiences because while I have my own, um, it's fun to hear from you guys. Were you ever thinking of trying agave? Yeah, I wouldn't mind trying that at some point. Um, I, I just, let's see, I'll put it this way. I have been, I've kept pretty close to honey. I've used a lot of, or some, um, maple syrup as of recently one thing i did which i found it was interesting um i made a meat off camera and I, I do that i have two or three going on right now that are not on camera i might do a video video about them in the future but what i did with this meat is i made a um it was a it was a berry mead and i wanted to back sweeten instead of with honey with uh with maple syrup so what I used, if I can find it, this was my own learning experience. Somewhere in the world. Yeah, there it is. Okay. I used this um, Griffin syrup. Now, I know that this is not uh, – I, I bought this with the intention of using it in mead making a while back and then found out, oh, it's got potassium sorbate and potassium metabisulfite. I can't use it. So I just put it away. I haven't used it in a while. Well – when I made this mead, I was like, sorry, I was pleased with where I was at, and I wanted to be able to back sweeten without having to stabilize with uh, potassium sorbate and potassium metabisulfite. So what I did was I added some of that into it that has sorbate metabisulfite, the already in it. In my brain, I said, this is not the yeast, or, or yeah, the yeast are not going to ferment on this because it has a sorbate. Well, that's not true uh, because there was definitely some reaction to um, the maple syrup. So just because something has sorbate and metabisulfite does not necessarily mean that it will not ferment. What it means is that it will not ferment as easily. Uh, the yeast might struggle some, which is where we get into the issues of uh, how well is your mead fermenting. So that's, that's something I learned recently. All right, trying to get you guys comments. I have a hard pineapple going right now. 10 gallons. Nice. Um, Acer Glen. Yep, yep. That's what we just talked about. Five gallon traditional. Uh, pineapple citrus. I highly suggest if you're just getting into mead making, it, it's wise to um, make a big batch of mead. If you can afford to purchase like 15, uh, 12. Yeah, 12 pounds of honey, something like that. Make yourself a three or four gallon mead and then split that into different things. I think a lot of people will suggest that too because then you have the ability to play with each thing, uh, to split it up and then play and make different kinds of mead. So I would suggest doing that if you like to try making different kinds of meads. But I, I, I'm at the point now where I'm just making a bunch of one mead. I do have a couple things that I do um, that are 
like I have some traditional mead, the six gallon traditional mead that I'm going to split up in the future. However, I just am letting it age before I do that. Just now trying the blackberry nine pounds. Yeah. 71 B. That's a great one for the, uh, um, uh, for the blackberry recipe you're doing. That sounds really good. So, uh, as you, wait, is this dry? Okay. Let's try enough. So here's a color showing I'm trying to make sure it doesn't drip zero minutes 15 minutes i'm dripped a little bit there we'll get to 30 minutes soon you can see that it's already changing colors uh, as we're going along changing sugars all that stuff is adapting but just take some time still smells great in here i love this smell i'm a big fan what's the gravity you shoot for in your meads that's a great question it depends on what i'm going for if I'm making a light session mead, which a, a session mead generally means something around 7% or lower, um, I'm going to be using way less honey. So for a session mead, I might use something like instead of um, the three pounds per gallon, excuse me, I might use one and a half, maybe in that realm. It really just depends on uh, your water you're using. So if I'm doing something like that, most of the time I shoot for about 1.100 as my, or 1.090 to 1.100, which is about 12% to 13%. I feel like that's a good range for a mead. Uh, one thing I do want to, it's uh, super important to me to share to you guys. I have had a lot of experience making bouchets. It's my favorite kind of mead to drink, fr quite frankly. I have learned that bouchets, first of all, need time. Um, if you don't give a boche time, what happens is it just, it doesn't age well, or it doesn't drink well. Um, over time you will find that different notes pop out of a, a boche. So that's one thing that I found find really important. And two is, uh, a boche with a little bit of headspace on it, little air on top is not the end of the world. Now I, that's not set in stone. Maybe that was my one experience where I experienced that. But I did notice that, that uh, the oxygen on top did not greatly affect the mead. And I was kind of pleased with that, frankly. Got some more people talking. I currently have a peach bomb in secondary. That sounds good. Um, five gallon, 20 pounds of blackberries. Wow, that's a lot of blackberries. Holy cow. How long do you usually do fruits in secondary? I did mine for two weeks and racked. Um, that's about the same thing for me. Two to three weeks. It depends on the taste and sometimes the fruit. I've noticed that apples can pretty well get their flavor imparted in two weeks. Um, citrusy fruits might take a little longer to get their flavor to really impart. So I think that's one, that's one you might have to uh, leave in there for longer. My suggestion is if you're trying to figure out how long to leave your fruit in, taste test your mead with the fruit in it over time and see if you get to a point where you like it, you might have to leave it in longer. You might just be able to get by with only a certain amount of time. What are your thoughts on aging um, in oak barrels? I would love to do that. I do not have any oak barrels. Um, I know you can get them. Uh, Amazon, you can get them from people. You can get the charred version. You can get all these things, different kinds of wood varietals. Um, I just haven't done that, quite frankly. So I will be uh, experiment that one day. We'll see. I'd love to be able to do it. I just haven't been able to do it. What was in the barrel prior? Um, you know that that dictates a lot of uh, how how well the mead ages in that barrel because there's some that just don't age super well. What are the pros and cons of adding flavor? In primary versus secondary? This is an age old question and it's a great question. Um, so, in my experience, and I'm speaking completely from my experience, so please don't yell at me and say, you're wrong. Uh, I have noticed that every fruit is different. It doesn't matter what kind of fruit, or uh, I cannot give you an overarching blanket statement for every single fruit. I'll give you my experience with specific fruits. So I've done a test in the past um, 
specifically with what you're asking, primary versus secondary fruit addition, I did it using pineapples. So I made a traditional mead, um, the same recipe on both sides. I added pineapple into the primary of one and the primary or the secondary of the other. The thing that I noticed is I had different pineapple characters pop out of the mead as, um, as that went along. Um, and I think that was mainly because the yeast activity dictates a lot of your fruit characteristics. Also, um, in the primary, you have way more fermentation occurring. So that means that there is automatically, uh, automatically aroma from the fruit leaving the mead. So you kind of have to watch out for that. The pros of primary, secondary depend on the fruit. That's the first point. And I'm sorry, I hate that. That's, that's not the answer I want to give. I wish I could tell you an over a blanket statement for it all, but, uh, you get different characteristics with each fruit for one and two, you can generally leave your fruit in longer in, uh, in the secondary, in the primary, it goes and does its thing, but you kind of run the risk of, um, any bad bacteria taking over. If you haven't sanitized your fruit well in the secondary, you have alcohol content to protect your, your fruit. Therefore it's less likely that you're going to have any, um, bacteria take over hope that kind of helps you're gonna have to experiment on your own and tell me what you think do you bother checking and adjusting ph on a melomel i don't honestly I haven't really attacked ph i have a ph scale to be able to do that stuff i haven't done it yet um one day i'll experiment with it i i don't want to lean so much into the the, the side that mead making is like you have to have eight million things um, I know, I think you have to have the right equipment and the right ingredients. I know that pH in those crazy things matter. Um, I just haven't experimented with it yet. Sorry. Um, that might make someone angry. Currently waiting on a bucket of honey from Dutch gold, planning a first sizer. Nice. Um, do you ever add tea as a tannin? Yeah. Um, so if you want to change the mouthfeel of your mead, you're going to need to do a couple things. People use uh, different ingredients. Like, for example, tea is one way to change the mouthfeel because it has that tannic value to it. If you want to achieve more tannins in your uh, mead, you can add it probably in the primary. Um, I would hesitate to add it to the secondary because then you're diluting your alcohol content. Um, people have also used other things like uh, lactose to change the mouthfeel of their mead before. It all just depends on what you're going for and what's what's your, your mead going to be, like what flavors are you trying to get. You can use lactose in some things, you can use tea in some things, but not every single mead needs tea in it. Um I know it's very open ended and ballpark question, but what is your favorite mead that you've made? Huh. My one of my all time classics for me right now is the apple cinnamon mead that I um, I've been revamping as the years have gone by. Um, I think I'm at a good point with it where I'm I'm happy and I want to recreate that same recipe. I have about five or six iterations. Um, I do enjoy my peppermint meat a lot, but recently the one that's really piqued my interest, this is about to go off, um, is the, uh, is, I call it my sweet heat mead. It is a, um, a pineapple and habanero, uh, yeah, pineapple habanero mead. So it has some interesting heat on it. I make a big traditional mead and then there's a, a company called the uh, pot liquor kitchen and they make uh, all kinds of uh, brewing brewing and just baking jams and various things um, i bet i can find it here in a second but i put this pineapple and habanero jam into the mead let it set in the secondary for like a month and it turns out really good so there will be probably soon a giveaway on the channel for one of those uh, the bot or the video about that mead you'll find out that's one of my favorites boche by far one of my favorites um boche just take more time and so i think that's the thing that's makes me hesitant um okay 
a lot of questions. Sorry, I missed it. Have you ever tried making a mead without the chemical sorbates? Yes. Um, the, the only issue with not using those things sometimes, like, yes, you get a more natural flavor. The problem is if you want to back sweeten, um, if you want to stop your meat at a certain point, uh, you can't really have that control because you're basically allowing the yeast to dictate what happens. So I'm not the biggest fan of just dumping sorbate and uh, metabisulfite in all the time. However, if you're wanting to make like a session mead that's like a 7% mead, there is not a mead yeast out there or really wine yeast or even beer yeast that stops at, I, I mean, I guess there's some beer yeast that stop at seven, but most yeast go beyond seven. So you kind of have to figure out how to stop that mead from fermenting. Um, if you at least want to back sweeten, there's some, some weird things within that. I have done it before. I just use some of those chemicals. Um, anything you shouldn't add to a mellow mel because it turns out gross, hmm, like fruit wise. Uh, I can't think of a fruit that I've put in that just didn't work. Um, I know that like uh, watermelon does not do well in fermentation um, from what I've heard. I've, I've done a watermelon mead in a different fashion before, but you know, that's okay. Cucumber. Yeah. I have a cucumber wine I made out of a kit. It's really good. What is your go-to yeast? I use a couple different ones. Um, right now it's been the Lalvin EC1118. Uh, the 71B has also turned out some really good beans for mead for me. Uh, I liked the D47 for a long time, and in some recent tests I've done, I'm finding that it doesn't do as well as I thought. So I'm a little bit bummed about that, to be honest with you. So I am using it less. It's still okay yeast. Um, I've also used the Lavin QA23. That one has done pretty well. It gets up to 16%, which is interesting. The um, D47 gets up to 14%. The EC1118 gets up to 18 So if you just know what you're going for, you depend on use that. But yeah. Pasteurizing if you want to stop and back sweeten, it's true. I, uh, I just have not gone that route yet. Broccoli mead, ew. That sounds gross. Um, have you ever thought about opening a meadery and selling your mead? Yes. To answer your question. Uh, there are some logistical things that terrify me a little bit about starting a meadery. Um, will I one day hopefully embark on that journey? Yes. Will it be soon? I don't know. Uh, there's just a lot to do. And um, I'm, I don't want to... Uh, I'd have to make some life changes before that would happen, unfortunately. So this thing's getting, I don't know if you can see it right now, but we're getting pretty close to the top. It's not too, it's not dangerous. Like it's, it's bubbling very slowly. So I am going to pull it off for just a moment. Maybe let it chill out. We got a lot of foam on top. One big debate that people, uh, I think that's something I hear all the time is that people suggest that you, when you mix your water in with your yeast, that you don't actually, uh, that you take out the foam off of the mead um, with a boche. And I, I don't know, I, I can see where people are talking about. They, I think the idea is that the foam has a bunch of stuff you don't want in your mead. And to me, it's more so just still honey. So I'm okay with um, throwing my, my foam in there on top. In fact, when we get to that point, I will probably just do that. I'll be using a, uh, I'm using a bucket for this, even though we're making a one gallon mead. Um, I like going a little over one gallon because what I found is that when you take that one gallon out and you put it into a one gallon glass carboy, uh, you actually end up with about one gallon. So I get to like 1.2 gallons and then after sediment, it turns into one gallon, if that makes sense. All right, what else we got going on? Apricot, and uh, I'd love to do an apricot meat at some point. That sounds interesting. Um, I got to tour your local meadery. I don't have a local meadery. I'm a little bit angry about that. Uh, there's a, uh, 
Um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, there is a a cider slash meadery, but they really don't make that much mead, to be honest with you. Um, they are more so cider-esque, and that's fine. Local is an hour and a half away. Yeah. Uh, that's how I feel. Um, it'd be nice to have some local meat around me. However, there's no company doing that. So I just got to make my own. One day, I would love to start a meadery. We'll find out. All right. So I took it off the heat for a second to try and hopefully get the uh, um, the foaming to go down a little bit just so I didn't risk any boil over, stuff like that. We're making it pretty far, though. It's pretty good. Time to be the change you want in this world. That's true. Man, I really like this bow shade honey in a beer as I'm uh, tasting it more. I'm, I'm definitely enjoying um, the caramelized side when added to that beer. This And the blueberry side is what's interesting to me. Uh, I definitely will be making more of this in the future. All right, where are we at? Let's see, we are I would love It's really fun uh, to me to look back at some of my old content. I don't know if if, if any of you are um subscribers from like when I first started. I started back in August, no, July, I don't even know when it was. Maybe somewhere in that August of 2017 started making videos and uh, I was, it was just a, in my spare time and still kind of in my spare time thing, but I had one camera and I looked into making beer, but I didn't end up wanting to do beer because you needed more equipment. And I noticed with mead that you only needed a limited amount of equipment and then uh, it just seemed interesting. So started making some mead. And you can, if you're, you know, feel so inclined, you can go back and look at the old videos. Uh, it's really interesting to see the quality change. I, I hope that my quality has gotten better over time, but I don't know if that's true or not. I think it's true, but that's okay. Let me get back to my questions. Did I miss a braggot? Yeah, well, okay. So I didn't record this, this beer. Sorry to you if you if you're uh, wanting to have seen that. I did not record. Uh, I don't record all of my brews because, for my sanity, uh, I like to have some that I can just do not on camera. Uh, it does get a little bit stressful in life when everything you do and like every if I did everything in my brew house and had to record it, um, it just wouldn't be as fun. So I like to have a few things. I did this off camera, and um, you know I'll, one day I'll do like a, a video on it, but. I, I didn't document the process. Wish I had a better live stream setup. I want to start a meadery. I think. Um, I think it'd be nice if there are just more meteries in general. Uh, there are definitely not a lot around me, which is kind of a bummer. Okay. Man, this is, okay, I think, yeah, we're good. We're at 30 minutes. Here we are. This is 0, 15, 30 minutes. That's our, our current color change. I wish there was better lighting. This might not take the full hour 15. Uh, I think a smaller quantity of honey um, obviously uh, burns faster, boches faster, so I probably will not need to do an hour and 15 minutes. And um, my last boche I did, I made a yeast starter, which helped a lot. I, I'm not gonna do that this time. In fact, I probably need to go find my yeast wherever it is at. Gotta find my yeast, where's, go back to my questions. Me, yes, meat is in low demand. Do you use malt extract in special grains with braggots? Considering, yes. Uh, I, I have made a couple braggots now from beer kits, like this last one. 
was from a blueberry honey ale, which came with the malt extracts um, and some honey and some honey like uh, wheat kind of stuff. So there's definitely that within the the kit. Um, you can of course go make your own kits if you go to your local brew shop, which you should be doing anyways because uh, support your local brew shop. Uh, you can build your own beer, which is nice. And uh, I I have. Uh, tr- well, I'll put it this way. When you make a braggot, you need to have 50% of your honey or of your uh, edible sugars be the honey because that's what a braggot is. Now, some people, uh, I go by that general rule. Um, the meat house is a little bit different. When they talk about uh, uh, braggots, they are looking not at the stats of it. Is it 50% honey? They're looking at the taste. Is it taste like it has honey in it? And which is, I mean, valid, very good. I am just not rolling with that same thing, unfortunately. What is the largest boche you've made? Eight gallons. Um, I've done an eight gallon one. It was 24 pounds of honey. It was quite a bit. Would you make, or would you try a dandelion mead? Yes, definitely. Uh, I just don't know where I would get dandy, that quantity of dandelions. Do you get all your yeast local or do you get any online? I get most of my yeast online through Amazon. I will order in bulk or not bulk, in packets of 10. Um, my Lavin products, uh, my Red Star stuff that I've been using recently in a couple of videos, uh, all of that. But I, oh, I've also done some, I've done some stuff from my brew shop. However, uh, I, haven't done as much. You can find more options online because there are a ton of yeast out in the world. Speaking of which, I got to find mine. Let's see. Somewhere. There we are. We're only going to need five grams of yeast for this thing at max. This is only one gallon. We really only need like probably Two grams. However, we're going to um, we're going to end up using probably the whole thing just to make sure it goes. Uh, a boche has kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier. A boche has different, maybe some different pH properties because the honey has been burnt, caramelized. Um, it does change the chemical nature of a uh, honey. So there, you're going to find that the um, the mead might struggle a little bit differently. I, or the yeast, I always put more yeast in boches than you need because you really want to enable the yeast to take off and do what they, uh, they need ultimately. Also, because honey is a nutrient, um, is the nutrient for the yeasts, you need to make sure and add some yeast nutrient to your boche. My unfortunate fact is I just ran out of yeast nutrient. I have yeast energizer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to order some more. Um, I'll get my uh, my yeast nutrient online, so I'll get some more of that. But I'll put some yeast energizer in today. Hopefully my yeast nutrient will come in and I can add that. But the the uh, boche is lower on nutrients than most other meads, unfortunately. Kind of have to watch out for that. Down to your last packets, yep. 30 packets, man. You got a lot. Yeah, I, uh, so one thing, I, and this is an opinion, so please, you know, don't, don't scream at me in the comments, but I, uh, I don't always, um, uh, stop real fast. There we go. I do not always, um, refrigerate my yeasts. I know a lot of people do. They will take in and refrigerate them. Um, let me pull this off for a second. We are rapidly changing colors. They'll put them in the fridge for until they use them, basically. I have been okay not doing that. I know that it, there's nothing wrong with putting them in the yeast or in the yeast, in the fridge. I just, I don't know. I haven't done it. All right. We are, yeah, we're changing colors greatly. In fact, we're almost, I think I'm probably going to let this go for 15 more minutes. We're going to find out. Let it go for an hour. I'll show you guys here in a moment. This thing has definitely changed colors. And, um, I don't want to burn it. I don't want the uh, honey to get too dark and lose all of its character, nice character that I want. I just want it to be a little bit different. We'll decide here in a second. We might go to the hour 15. 
I know some people have made bouchets and they almost burn the honey. Or, or I keep saying burn. They almost blacken the honey to where it is, you know, a different substance at that point. Questions. Okay. Uh, are there a lot more unfermentable sugars? If you caramelize it more, yes, you get more unfermentable. Do you reuse yeast? If so, have you noticed any difference in pitching fresh yeast? I haven't really reused yeast because I've had enough of mine. Um, I know you can. You can wash your yeast. You can do all the stuff to get it going. I haven't done it. Um, one day, I'll do a test about that. you have any preferences or advice on liquid versus dry yeast? Uh, from what I know, liquid yeast is more actively alive. Therefore, you can start your brews a little faster with liquid yeast. Um, now, that I know there are different characters, like White Labs does liquid yeast, and they do a lot of great stuff. Um, but they they don't really do – there's no huge difference in my brain between dry and liquid yeast. Because really, if you rehydrate your yeast, you've created liquid yeast. So that's my opinion, at least. What is the best practice of removing honey out of a five-gallon bucket without making a mess? Um, so depending on the quantity you're trying to get out, I have had a um, – I will normally, where's it at? I'll normally use old honey buckets and fill these things up. So this thing was five pounds. This is what I use today. Um, this was, uh, you know, was five pounds. I will fill up a bunch of different jars and have them just to use for other things. I will generally just pour the honey into different places. The new honey company I've used recently, um, this web restaurant store, has their honey buckets come with the spout. So I literally turned two buckets upside down, flipped that whole thing over and then opened up the spout on it and just shoved all of my containers underneath it. And it just slowly dropped in there. That's one way to do it. If you don't have that, you can always scoop it out, but then you have to clean off the side of whatever you're scooping with kind of a pain. Um, I wish I could tell you more NPS. I, um, I would just pour if you can. I know it's heavy though, 60 pounds of honey. What kind of honey we are, are we using? We are using a Florida orange blossom honey, which reminds me, if you just joined, we're making a boche. This is the 10K boche because we're almost to 10K subs. Um, hopefully we can get there tonight. I don't know. Uh, if you want to help, please uh, shoot this video out, share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter, share it on wherever you want. Um, and then hopefully you tell your friends about, some, about the channel because we can continue to grow. Um, but we're making a boche. It's just a one gallon boche. I could put the recipe somewhere. I probably should have put it in the description, but we're not, I didn't. So we're using three and a half pounds of, uh, orange blossom, honey, gallon of water and a packet of Lauven EC one, 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 eight yeast. Uh, only refrigerator after open a pack. Yes, I agree. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I definitely, I don't think I've seen that video from CS Brews, but they might, I don't know. I'll go check that out. Weird. Is this dry enough yet? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Color. Uh, there we go. See the huge change? Zero, 15, 30, 45. Um, that's a big change ultimately where I'm comparing it to this. So this is my other one I did. Uh, last week, you see that the this was with 20 pounds of honey. This was with this is three and a half pounds of honey. So obviously this one took a little more time to go. This is an hour and 15 minutes. This has only been 45 minutes, and they're about the same color. Uh, I am tempted to just let it go for that hour 15. However, I don't want to jack up the honey and defeat this mead too early on. Searching for answers. Can you can corn syrup be used? Uh, anyone have an opinion about that? I don't necessarily have an opinion because I've never used it. Um, I don't know the properties. If it has potassium sorbate or potassium metabisulfite in it, there's a good chance you can't use it. So I don't know. Maybe someone has an opinion in the comments. 
Where did I put that? There we go. I'm a little leery now of leaving this. At some point, I'll work on a better stream setup. But in my same problem of my computer not being able to um, handle recording screen, uh, doing screen recordings, um, there's no way to be able, be able to handle a live stream. So I'm having to use different avenues to do this. How much experimenting or experimentation have you done with uh, intervals of time when making a bow shake? Uh, do you mean in regards to the end result? Um, I have not made a video that like, I know what you're asking. So you're asking is, have I made a video where I have let a, a 30 minute bow shade mead go for six months and then a 45 minute, so like that. I haven't done that before. Uh, part of my problem, and maybe here in a second, when I, if this is at a manageable rate right now, um, I'll grab my live stream setup, but I'll show you the, the mead room. I'm currently a little over capacity, to be honest with you. Uh, I got a lot of stuff going on, um, and I don't want to spoil all the videos to come, but I do, I'll let you guys know a little bit of stuff. Um, yeah, I, NPS, I, uh, at some point I will, um, I'll do that. Not necessarily. It, that's just a big, it's a big video. You know what I mean? I have right now three videos going on that are at least three, going to take at least three months. Um, I've got a video that's going to take six months that I'm working on. So with these big time videos, uh, that's just a lot to keep up with. I really enjoy, and hopefully you guys enjoy the videos where I can make a mead from beginning to end. The only problem with that is I'm making a mead from beginning to end, which means the moment you start it to drinking it, and that normally takes at least three or four months. Can you turn out a mead in a month? Yeah, for sure. Is it the best after a month? No. Um, so I'm trying to put out some videos where you guys get to see beginning to end of a mead. Um, high fructose corn syrup can add sweetness, but not always in a good way. Not good for fermentation. So here we go. I have no experience with that. So I will not pretend that I do. Okay, let me get this to a manageable place. And then we'll I'll show you guys what's happening kind of in the mead room currently. I'll pull it off for a moment. It's definitely changed properties. There's a lot going on. Let's see. Okay. We'll take you guys in here through the mead room. Maybe. Okay. Um, put this back on. Here we go. So, this is exciting. A little sneak peek behind the scenes. Here's what we got. You guys have seen this before. Um, let me if I can turn this around. How about this? Is it awkward? Turn. There we go. So you guys have seen, obviously, the meat room before. And I just added some new shelving up at the right corner. You can see up there, those are all half-gallon um, jars. So that obviously has... A lot going on there. Then I also have everything going on there. I just added this shelf, kind of ghetto-ishly. And it does, it looks like it's floating, but it is supported on there. So um, I also have everything happening here. This is my bottle or my drying rack. And then I added some more shelving and I have even more. So look at all of that. I got too many bottles going on. So there is that. Then, let me open this up. This is some active fermentations currently, or not all fermentations. Those are all three gallon glass, glass carboys back there. Um, that's a five gallon back there with peppermint mead that's still going. And that's a mesquite traditional. So I, uh, obviously those, those are, I got some fermenting things, which is good. And then um, down there, I don't want to try and open those doors because that's kind of a pain to do one-handed. But 
Uh, and then I have something fermenting here. You can see, I'm not gonna spoil what it is, but I've got some things happening in the mead room and I hope that you guys are um, hopefully excited for some of the content to come because I got a lot to, to show you guys. Okay, let me set this back up. Maybe I can set this up where you can see the honey, kind of. There we go. You can get a little side profile of the honey. Perfect. Okay. Um, I'm going to stir up a little bit. Are we already at 15 again? Almost at an hour? That's crazy. This has been a very quick hour. This is not normally a very fast hour for me. Instant pot with honey in jars works well for small amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, uh, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm very fortunate and thankful to have a mead room like I do. Um, I'm not going to pretend like everybody does. When I bought this house, uh, I definitely needed a music room for one. But I also realized I probably need a place to store all my mead. So I was able to convert that into my storage. Should have your brew room done by next year. Nice. That's awesome. That's really exciting. Um, I don't know what I would do if I didn't have a brew room like that. I couldn't do as much stuff as I want to. Uh, it would be really hard to fit it in my house. And all the boxes I showed you guys, the funny part is that's barely scratching this. I mean, that that's a lot. That's a bulk of what I have. That's probably 60%. I've got 40%, the rest of it, shoved everywhere. So uh, I have boxes out and I have a little sunroom area and those are holding just empty bottles. Um, I've got stuff in closets. I've got stuff shoved, shoved underneath my bed. Um, I've got kind of a Noah's Ark thing happening now where I, uh, every bottle of mead or beer or wine that I've made, I put back two bottles of it into a different box and I've been storing those away. And I do that for the purpose of not drinking them for one, but two, so I can go ahead and, uh, save them for a year or two or more and see how they change. Um, the ones that I really, really like, I've left them, I, I put more bottles back, but I keep at least two bottles of everything I use. Can you tell us about your cat? Yeah, he's, a uh, he, he's, his name's Gavin, that's for one, and, uh, he's exactly like Garfield. Um, very antisocial. You probably see him in videos every once in a while. He'll, uh, pop by and say hi and then keep going. Um, he is very lazy, very fat. He's literally the embodiment of Garfield. So that's a little bit about him, if you've ever seen that. Sounds like you need to give more away. I, I really do give a lot away. You'd be surprised how much meat I do end up giving. Part of my thing is I want to age it a little bit so it's even better. So I have sometimes I have a hard time like giving away all my bottles because um, they're not at their peak, which... A meat is never really at its peak. You know what I mean? It's like, it's kind of its own struggle. Can you give accurate temp of the honey? Like what it's at right now? Let's find out. I don't know if this will, um, if this will show or get up to there. We're going to find out though. Let's break it down. A little star sand water. Okay. Honey currently is... We're above 200, we're above 250. The honey is at, oh, there we go. I gotta check my stuff again. The honey is about 255 degrees right now. Um, and that's with, it's setting at about 30% power currently. All right, let's get another check. We're at the hour mark for this. And this is kind of where I'll decide if I want to pull it off or um, or what I want to do exactly. I'm going to let it go for at least a few more minutes. I don't want it to be black. That's the big thing. I don't want it to be not usable. Maybe. Oh, I'm trying to decide. It's definitely very different. Yeah, I've got a lot of the foam in this right now. 
I wish I could show you. It's definitely different. We're gonna let it, we're gonna make this a darker, not burnt. I think 15 minutes will not kill this thing. I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm probably not gonna be able to add the honey in on this, um, on this stream because when I add my water to my honey, uh, that's the honey, my yeast to this. Um, when I add my honey and my water together, it's probably still going to be really hot. And if I were to throw my yeast on top of this, when the temperature of the brew is 120 degrees, they would just die. So um, we're going to, I'm going to wait for that. I'll, I'll finish by mixing it up and then we'll close down the live stream. But we got about 15 minutes left of this and then we'll, we'll see what we do next. But I actually have never, for some reason, taken the temperature of the honey before. Uh, I thought I'd done that, but I guess not. So, yeah, I, I guess it's funny you guys asking about Gavin. He's a uh, he's quite the character. You'll see him in more videos. Uh, he kind of does his own thing, and there are many videos. I did one recently. He um, he he likes to be in the room when I record sometimes, and I was doing something that had the door closed, so he couldn't get out, and he just he was making all kinds of noise trying to get out. So uh, I think it ended up in the video somehow. So. You'll see that in the future, possibly. I would love to know in the comments, how many of you have actually made a bush egg? Because I feel like a lot of people have, um, but I also feel like there's a large demographic of people that have never, never made one before. And uh, I think that's important that we, the one that you try to make one because it's, it's a good kind of mead. I have brewed traditional mead with just honey, water, and yeast. It turned out thin and watery. What's missing? Um, can you tell me how much honey and how much water you put in? Because I think that will dictate my answer for you. Uh, if you did not put a lot of honey into it, you probably have a lighter mead. Okay, I'll put it this way. If you've ever had a cider, um, like an apple cider, it's very thin and I mean, they're carbonated. So that already adds to the thin mouthfeel. But if you have a cider, it's light. If you have a heavy wine, a heavy red wine, it's um, very, not thick. I don't like that word for this, but it's definitely got a, a bit thicker mouthfeel. Uh, so I think if you don't have enough honey, then it just probably was not, was it's not gonna have the mouthfeel you want. Ever have going to yeah definitely you need to make one um try I tried adding cooked honey to the secondary which is not a bad idea that's that's good too though um Daniel yeah yeah never made one but really want to does it come out tasting like bourbon uh, in my experience my boche somewhere in the world I have I used to have a bottle of my boche one of my favorite ones um it it comes out. Each, at least mine have come out with a whiskey-esque note to them. And I really like that because I'm a big whiskey guy. Um, that's probably, you know, my go-to, one of my go-to drinks. Of course, beer. Um, of course, mead. Um, whiskey is my third thing. So you get a lot of whiskey taste from it. No boche. Definitely need to make one 12 gauge. Made one. AGS, yes. Um, if you haven't made one, just make a gallon, take your normal honey you've been using. And just like, I hope I've shown you tonight that it is as simple as just throwing it on the stove and letting it go. Because what you'll find is, uh, it's not that hard if you're watching it. Like you notice though, I'm sitting here watching this thing to make sure it doesn't boil over. And I have my, I've done it a couple times. So I've, I have figured out my heat settings to be able to do this properly, but um, it's really not hard. It's pretty, pretty simple. And um, just go for it. I would suggest going for it. Uh, Ducky, you can, I'll tell you the instructions. It's real simple. Take your honey, your three pounds of honey, put it into a, a pan, pot in this case, and heat your honey up for at least, let's say, 45 minutes. It will start to change colors like this. Check it out, y'all. This is the color wheel. This is where we started tonight. This is 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and then an hour. 
trying to get there we go so this is just a little bit darker in an hour and 15 we're gonna have a, a even darker color honey it changes the character um then you just mix up your your honey or your water and uh your yeast like you normally do so it's pretty simple how often do you mix different kinds of honey when back screening um i've done it a couple times i try to stick to the same honey i used from the primary however there have been many times where i just grab like my my uh whatever clover honey that i have just lying around and i'll just throw that into um, a mead um, if i just want some light back sweetening i definitely have i've never experimented in mixing honeys in the primary i'd love to do that and see what changes with that um, i just haven't done it yet um lost myself where we are i plan on making a boche yeah Car caramelized carrot blossom honey interesting oh here's a question for y'all what is the weirdest honey you've ever seen um or heard of i should say because there's some there are lots that i've seen and heard of that i've never used uh the one i'm thinking of is meadow foam and a lot of people say it has a it's like is it cotton candy-esque notes i can't remember it's marshmallow that's what it is it has a very marshmallow e note to it so meadow foam is kind of interesting uh buckwheat orange blossom yeah that sounds good um marijuana honey that just that sounds interesting i'm sure someone has made uh a medicinal mead you could call it that if you did it you could just call it a medicinal mead but I definitely have not. I, oh, here's some other ones. If you look at uh, Dutch Gold, they have a great uh, site. The other site, I can't recall off the top of my head. Um, I just used them, had better prices, but I should remember that. I'll have to try some 420, honey. <laughs> yeah, caramelized carrot. Yeah, that's definitely, that, that was a weird one. Caramelized carrot, blossom honey. It definitely uh, it makes me think about what I could do with that, though, because they're, the thing with mead that's so interesting is that you can use the same water and same yeast with a different honey and get so many different characters. Uh, obviously, that's the same for beers and wines and all that stuff. However, it's just interesting with honey. And where honey comes from, it's just it's wild to me. I made a butterscotch boche. Whoa layer of butter <laughs> that sounds really interesting i want to try snowberry honey i've never heard of that what is snowberry honey interesting all right let's see we got seven minutes left on this very very different color um what i'm gonna do now I will pull this off in a second. What I try to do when I finish a boche, in this case, like right now, this is going to be, this is finishing up um, the, the heating portion. Uh, I like to, while it's still warm, I like to go ahead and put my, um, my honey into the container because it slides out of that uh, pot super easily. So what I'm going to do is just pour my uh, purified water that I have here. I'm going to do a full gallon, and I talked about this earlier. The reason I'm using a full gallon is because uh, it will total more than one gallon of liquid when my honey's in there. But I want that because the end result after sediment will lead me to have one gallon left. And uh, I think that's helpful. We have our yeast we talked about here. Um, this is the Lauvin EC1118. I've used it for some traditionals before. It works really well. It's a good one for that. It also works well for Boches, in my opinion, in my opinion at least. Uh, we're not going to add that yet because the honey added to this water is going to make it really hot. We, this honey is 200 degrees right now, 250 degrees. So there's no way even my cold water that I add is going to equal a um, 90, less than 90 degree mead currently. You should add some water to the pot yet. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Could you describe the difference between mesquite wood chips and mesquite honey? 
when you add when you add wood of any sort to your mead, what you're getting is, um, of course, the the flavor that comes from that wood. So mesquite in that case. You're also getting a mouthfeel change because the wood chips provide a tannic value to your uh, mead in that case, and um, so that changes the mouthfeel. You're getting the same result of like what did we say, mesquite? What did you say? Yeah, mesquite uh, flavor. But I would say that it changes the mouthfeel more. I'm sure there are more differences than that. Probably did not describe that super well. Sorry. Have you ever infused honey before using it? I have not. It sounds interesting, though. From the description of the snowberry, um, note of honeysuckle. Ooh, I like honeysuckle. That sounds good. Hey, Jacob, thank you so much, man. I appreciate you saying that. Been watching you since I started making mead. The patience to make single videos showing the full process start to finish is amazing. And your setup is basically life goals. I'm really, uh, uh, th thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, I have, uh, it's been a little bit hard to set and watch these things. I think the hardest thing for mead making, even for me as somebody who makes a lot of mead is literally setting and watching something just age because I want to drink it. You know, I, I enjoy getting to drink mead and not that I don't taste test my stuff over time, but, and you can definitely get yourself a mead room like this and make something work. Um, it, it worked out for me. I, if you have a mead closet, if you have a mead, uh, shelf, anything like that, start making your stuff. You might not be able to make all the meads you want in the world, but you can at least get going with it. So thank you again, Jacob. I appreciate that. That's really nice of you. Um, what kind of nutrient regimen do you do? There are two things you can do. A lot of people know this, but I'll go and say them. You can add all of your nutrients in the primary, which is what I'll do with this one. I will add uh, my teaspoon of yeast nutrient and teaspoon of energizer into this uh, and just let it go. The other way that's a little better, in my opinion, is the uh, staggered nutrient schedule, which is where you take and you add that same value, one teaspoon of nutrient, one teaspoon of, of uh, uh, what is it called? Energizer, good Lord. And you add it over four different periods. So you split it into four parts. You do it on day zero, day two, day four, day six. The better thing about that is that you're feeding over time, which allows the yeast to, I think, ferment a little better. It just takes more patience. You've got to be on top of your schedule with that. So I would highly suggest... Um, if you can do the staggered nutrient schedule to do that. I don't do the the staggered nutrient schedule unless I'm using a really big mead, in which case I do that so that it will firm it better over time. This one gallon will be fine. Uh, you have two live stream lobbies open. What? Oh. Oh, let me fix this real fast. Sorry, guys. I got people must be really confused. Um, here we go. No, well, I didn't realize I had two of them open. This is what I mean. I'm just not that the live stream world. I got to figure this out. This is rough. Sorry, Austin. All right. We got one minute left on our Boshang honey currently. So we are going to, in a moment here, mix it. In with this water, and I might let it set for a second because this is pretty pretty dang hot, 200 degrees. Uh, I don't want it to burn the plastic. So we'll also show you the end result of like the coloring because I think there's a there's been a big change. I'm gonna rinse this off, and I didn't do like a taste of the honey before it started, so I wish I could tell you that information. However, I haven't. Thank you, Austin. You definitely need to make your own mead, man. Go for it. Um, hopefully, I can put out some more content that you guys want to see. Which, while you're here, since you, if you're watching this, you're probably a viewer of mine, and I appreciate that. I would like for you to tell me what content do you want to see more of from me in the future. Um, I, of course, want to make videos. I make videos for you guys because, uh, well, I mean, it's fun for me to do. Um, 
the fun, more fun side of this is, is me making, <laughs> but then I do enjoy getting to educate you guys. What do you want to see more of? I would love to hear what you have to say. All right, we got, I'm going to pull this off. Let this sit for a second. Now we're going to get our, our color. This, we got a lot of foam on top here. This color change is pretty drastic. Maybe. I don't want to hype this up and then it not be. Maybe. Oh, see, I'm just getting the foam off the top. Okay, give me a second. I will show you the true color change when this foam chills out. Apparently, it is not. Let's go set this down. Actually, I have to rinse this off again. All right, let's read the comments. Uh, I want to see something complex, like a Boche Sizer Mellow Mel. Woo! Yeah, man. Dove challenge. Hardcore. Um, I, I can do that. Uh, five different brands of coffee, coffee mills, and a taste test. Okay. Love to see you try making an apricot mead, like I've got going. Definitely. I think that sounds awesome. Share that recipe with me. That'd be great. Uh, Daniel, thanks for stopping by, man. Appreciate you. I'd like to see you get your friends together for a tasting. Boy, do I have something in the future for y'all. Um, something made with buckwheat honey. I want to see more tasting comparisons. Uh, you know, you have the ones. Yeah, I do. I've been doing like some Friday tastings. Um, hopefully you guys have enjoyed those um, of my own meads and then other people's meads, um, other companies, those things. Uh, video on your list. However, I'd like to see a video of making a sparkling mead. That's a good point. Um, I have talked about carbonation in mead making. I did it on the podcast at one point, but I didn't do it in like a video form. So I'll make a sparkling mead at some point. Um, I've got some stuff coming out. In fact, I'll since you guys are watching, uh, I'll I'll tell you that on Monday I have a video coming out about um. Uh, about cold crashing. So if you want to know about that, my hope is that when I'm making these videos, um, I understand that you might know the topic already. And I hope that you'll see that my reach is to try and help all brewers in this case. And even if you know the information, um, I appreciate that. You know, I appreciate you, you still watching. So just be patient with me. If you already know everything that's happening. Yours versus theirs. Oh yeah, no, I did that one with the mango. Was it mango mead? No, it wasn't. I can't remember what it. Is. Yeah, I did. I've done one of those before. I just need to find some that are the same as someone else's. Uh, Mo, thank you so much. I want to thank you for everything you learn. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. I hope you enjoy that homemade grape wine. That's awesome, man. I uh, appreciate your kind words. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. Is it? Great. What temperature do you store your meat at? My house stays at around 68. I try to keep it there. Uh, so hopefully with that world, 68-ish. I'd like to see a mango capsule. Mel. Um, yeah, that sounds good. A fruit salad mellow mel. Man, there's some wild meats for sure. Okay, I need this to... I need the foam to move. How can I do this? Okay, here we go. Yeah, oh, there we go. Now we're getting it. I have to get past the foam in this case because there's there's pretty pretty big change. Okay. Uh, here is. I'll probably have to let this dry real fast. Give me one moment. I hyped it up again. Sorry, guys. We're about to mix all this. I'll I'll go ahead and mix this in. So here's what I'm gonna do. This honey, it's gonna go straight in here like this. And then we'll stir. And I, by the way, I sanitize this bucket and all that stuff. So before you get mad. And I'm doing, I'm leaving the foam on top. That's okay. Look at that. Okay. There's some, oh, maybe you can see it. See the color of the honey? Oh, maybe. It's almost as dark as the pot. Huge change. All right. Move this out of the way. And now... I need, I'm gonna stir this bad boy up. Get my drill. Oh. I 
keeps things nice. Makes life a little easier. Sanitizing. Yes. There we go. All right, we're gonna stir this up in a keg. Could you use oats in a brew? Yeah, you could. If so, could you add them in primary? I think if you added oats in a brew, you'd want to put them in the primary. It sounds like to me. I'm clear this up real fast. Oh. Well, I'll uh, take a temperature reading here in a second and show you why I'm not going to put the yeast in. Oh, I'm getting splashy. Normally, I try to go one way for a little while. Okay, this wasn't very much water, so it's pretty well mixed in. All right, okay, for sure. We also need to take a gravity reading, but the problem with doing the gravity reading right now is I think this thing is probably way too hot and it will make the airlock float in ways that I don't, um, I don't want for sure right now. Blood orange mead, ooh, yeah. I. Uh, I remember doing that. That's pretty fun. I'm, um, the, the fun thing about the blood orange is I did a blood orange dry hopped mead. It was really good. I was very pleased with that. I'll make that again in the future. All right. Here's the final color wheel reveal. That's a fun word. So you see, oh, get the light. There we go. So this is our 0, 15, maybe, let's see, 15, 30, 45, an hour. Hour 15, you can see that it changed quite a bit. This is where we are now. This is our final color. And the um, temperature of this whole thing is, oh, we're pretty close. Uh, still too hot to pitch my yeast. This thing's at 100 and eight degrees so um the max on the packet for rehydrating according to the packet at least is 105 i don't want to go past that because i don't want the yeast to die so what i'll do with this is wait probably 30 45 minutes until this gets down to um you know 90 ish maybe and then i'll sprinkle my yeast on top i'll also be adding yeast nutrient and energizer um I'm currently out of yeast nutrients, so I'll have to get more of that, but I'll add my energizer in and let that go. So I would love to take a few more questions and, uh, and then I'll close this thing down. I appreciate you guys coming here. Let's, let's get our last couple questions in and then, um, maybe if this is done or if this is cool enough, I can, uh, put my yeast in, but the end result after, of course, the, um, that you know, I put my yeast in is to put this put lid on top, airlock, write my information down, and let it go. I have a feeling with this one, we're gonna see some different things pop out because the honey has been so bochet, so to speak. Uh, I definitely anticipate it being a little bit different than my other ones. Ducky, thank you for your kind words. What kind of ABV are you looking at? Great question. Let's do it. 100 degrees. I think that might be manageable. I'll give you at least a rough estimate of what this is at. I gotta grab some things though. Airlocks. Okay. Let's figure this out. This is my. I don't know what. It's like a big turkey baster, but it's for brewing. I don't know what this thing's called. I bet if I'm gambling, man, and I think this is interesting, three and a half pounds of honey probably dissolved, some of it dissolved down to like 3.2. So I probably lost a little honey. I think this thing is probably setting at 1.12, if I'm guessing. We're going to find out. Uh, one thing about the bushe that I find interesting is uh, because I've left the uh, um, foam in there, it has some extra little floaty things around in it. And um, that's okay. That's not the end of the world, but I've got honey everywhere tonight. This has been great. Okay. Oh yeah. I'm getting, 
Oh, no, it's not that. I was going to say it's floating different. We are setting. Oh, it was really close. It is setting at. How are you off me? What are we here setting at? Currently, I was very close, but I wasn't right on it. 1.1, 1. 1, like 2.5, 1. No, I'm sorry, 1.1. 1. 1. 025-ish, just a little bit over that 1.1 range. So uh, that would mean that we're probably around 13.5% ABV possibility, which my EC1118 that I'm planning on using uh, will send me above that because that EC1118 goes to 18%. So I'm going to chew through all the sugars that it can. The thing with the Boche though, um, that we have to remember is that it has sugars now that are not fermentable. So I'll be left with some residual sweetness. All right, get to some questions. I'm gonna move this a little closer. Um, okay, so 1.1025 to tell you. Called a thief, yeah, that's what it's called, I forgot. Are you interested in developing a recipe for a commercial sale? Uh, you know, I would love to do that. I, I that would be that sounds fun. Um, what are signs of an infected brew? Uh, bad smells. If that's uh, that's the fusels, probably that's bad yeast freaking out, stressed. Um, if you see things floating in it that are like little white pods or anything like stuff like that, probably infected. Anything that looks off colored, anything like that, I would say. Um, looking for some questions. What are your thoughts on dumping out the base brew liquid for for taking your readings? What? Um, I I just dump my stuff back in after I take a gravity reading. I put it back into the container. Hasn't really hurt anything, especially if it's a big, a large lot of amount of mead. It's probably not going to affect it. Uh, some people, you know. Some people are not too happy about that. 12 Gage, thank you so much for your kind words. I appreciate it. I'm glad I could be some help to you guys. I need to write down this information too before. Uh, by the way, if you're making mead or beer or wine, make sure you're writing down your ingredients, your step-by-step -step process, what you've done, and maybe even notes. Uh, what are, what's the gravity? Uh, what does it taste like at a certain point? How long did it take to ferment? So that if you want to recreate the mead, you have a greater ability to do that. But if you don't write anything down, then you will be lost and not know what you did. And that's kind of a bummer. Okay, well, last few questions, my friends. And then again, this thing's going to take a little bit to cool down. So uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and close down the live stream. But I'd love to take a few more questions from you. And then we'll, uh, you know, I'll see you next time. But uh, what's your go to store bought mead? Um, I've been drinking a lot of Redstone meadery recently. I have this. This is what I have. I have recently um, Nectar of the Hops. Uh, I have actually not tried this one. I've tried some other Redstone things. That's been my go-to. That's really all I can get around here. I can get Chaucer's. I can get Redstone. I can get Moonlight meadery, which is also good. But I haven't gotten any of this stuff recently. How's the Blueberry Braggot coming along? right here and it is fully carbonated and everything it is wonderful um thank you for your kind words texas longhouse mead have you ever used goldenrod honey i have not that sounds sounds pretty good if you ever see a honey like that um you and you want you think it would be good for me i will i'll gladly pay for for it, if you just let me know, and uh, I'll I'll pay for the shipping, or whatever. But there's some honey things that I can't necessarily get. It has to, of course, be reasonable. You can't be like, I need eighty dollars for this two pounds of honey. That's crazy. Um, Redstone's great, Austin. Check it out. You need to try Lost Cause. Here's the problem with Oklahoma. They don't really ship. Not a lot of meadery ship to Oklahoma because we've got some really weird laws as far as liquor licensing goes. So, uh, unfortunately, I can only get certain things. There are some that ship to me, but not all do. So, like, I don't think Shrams ships to me, which is a bummer because Shrams is really good. Uh, 
he did a gallon for 85. That's still pretty pricey. Uh, to put into comparison, I spent hundred and seventy dollars, something like that, and got sixty pounds of honey from my my uh, orange blossom honey. So we'll see. I don't know. Eighty five for a gallon seems like a lot. Um, I, but you got to got to do what you got to do. Uh, Dutch gold is really good. My problem with Dutch gold is their shipping to me cost fifty bucks just to ship the or sixty bucks just to ship it, which is fine. It's sixty a sixty pound pail. However, uh, that's a lot of money. And then when you tack on the hundred and fifty dollars it costs for your sixty pounds of honey, you got yourself two hundred bucks. You put down the drain. Yeah, there you go. Sixty pounds for hundred eighty bucks. That's good. That's a solid price. I think if you if if my local apiaries were cheaper, I would absolutely support them and do more. The problem is, I tried to buy a gallon recently. Not recently; it's been a while um, from a local apiary. Apiary, or no, it was a, a sixty pound pail when I first was looking, and they wanted three hundred and fifty dollars. And I was like, I can't do that. And that was for me to go pick it up. How can you tell if you have accidentally yielded fusel alcohols? Weird smells, weird taste. Does it taste uh, like jet fuel? Does it taste like um, rubbing alcohol? Stuff like that. Um, really, just anything that smells off. If it doesn't smell normal, it could be a fusel. I just bought Alf Alpha from Dutch. Yeah, Alf Alpha. I love that. I used that. It was great. Yeah, def uh, I think if you can get it for cheaper. Uh, where do you get Orange Blossom? Let me... I can look it up real fast for you guys. Um... What's it called? I have to, I should know. I just, I've only used them once. I can't recall now. Oh, this right here. If you want to, I'm, I'm going to put it in the chat for you guys. It is web restaurant or web strant store. Uh, they have a bunch of good stuff on there. Um, that's pretty cheap. You know, I, I got this orange blossom. It was the, what got me with them. It was still 150 bucks for the pail. However, it was only 20 bucks to ship. So I saved money automatically. The orange blossom from Dutch gold was like $170. So, and it was 50 bucks in shipping. So I just didn't end up doing that. Let's see. Tana, thank you so much for the five bucks. I appreciate that. I appreciate you supporting me. You guys are really kind. And, um, the whole the whole point of this is for me to talk to you guys for one, but two, uh, I, I want to say thank you for supporting me and for allowing me to make content for you guys and for watching my stuff. I am very honored to sit here and say that I'm like at almost a 10K subscribers. I recall very vividly two and a half years ago when I started and I was getting like seven people watching my videos. Um, regularly and I was I was just like heck yeah this is awesome and I remember hitting 100 subscribers um and just being like what the heck why are people even subscribed to me this is silly so the fact that you guys are still here supporting me some of you have been around me for a long time it's incredible to think about um what we've done and I'm hope I hope that I'm innovating and give you guys content you want to see I have I'm not going to share. I don't want to share with you because uh, I don't want to give away. But I've got uh, two big series coming up um, that are going to come out soon. And one of them is going to be a long running series. It's probably going to take uh, – well, it, it, I can continue to do stuff with it. The other one is a callback to the past of something I've done. And I'm um, actually shooting video for that uh, pretty soon. I'm excited for that. I, of course, have Mead Mythbusters. I'm going to continue those. I have some videos coming out about that, doing various things. If you have questions for me, uh, you know, what Mead do you want to, Mead Myth do you want to see busted or questioned, uh, send it my way. Um, I'm doing tastings, of course. Uh, I'm still using or still making a bunch of meads with various recipes. Uh, I do the podcast, which you might be listening to that, or if you're watching on the live stream right now, you're hearing it. Uh, the podcast is What's New with Mead. So I have a very busy schedule of things to check out and I will continue to put out as much content as I can because I enjoy getting to talk to you guys. So, all right, any last questions? Nathan, thank you so much for the kind words. Sterling, thank you so much. Thank you, NC Citizen. 
man, I, again, I'm just very blessed. Uh, I never thought in a million years I'd sit here and be able to stream to, you know, a bunch of people and make content like this. So this is a blast. Man, you guys are great. <laughs> get a liquor. You know what? One day I'll get a liquor or a liquor license. Um, one of my goals is to uh, be able to start a meadery one day. So if I am starting that journey, I will probably clue you guys in on it, and um, you will know step by step what's happening currently in my life by not doing that. So, all right, you guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. Um, my last steps with this thing: let it set for a few minutes, make sure it cools down. Throw my yeast in, put the lid airlock on, throw my nutrients and energizer in whenever I get those, and let them go. If you uh, want to continue to support the channel, just keep watching my videos, like this video. If you want to help us get to 10,000 subscribers, which we're really close, I still need your help. Uh, share this video, share a video, uh, share the channel in some way, that would help. Um, and most importantly, for me, Go share your own meat experiences. Like I, I love you guys getting to share my stuff, but what's most important is that you guys go and talk about mead and share your stuff you make with your friends because that's how they get to try mead making. They get to where they get to try mead. Not many people go out and buy meads at this point, especially if they've never had one. So I uh, saw so a question. When's the next live stream? Um, I don't know. To be honest, I will try and plan it better next time. However, uh, you know, I have no idea. So, all right, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I will catch you all next time. And if you have any questions, of course, leave them in the comments. Go check out all that stuff. Uh, I'll gladly communicate with you guys as best I can. But I hope you have a wonderful night. And enjoy this Saturday of quarantine. All right. So, cheers.